All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just seeing if we are live on YouTube as well. I guess we are. I'm refreshing it. OK, awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in today to our uh, lunchtime EST spotlight session or wherever in the world you are. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, so today, we're going to be talking about uh, robots learning to play soccer with reinforcement learning. Uh, this is part of the reinforcement learning stream in ACE. Um, and today, we have Dr. Hans Bassani, uh, who is an associate professor at the Federal University of Pernambuco, uh, which is in Brazil. He has experience in machine learning and robotics and previously was a visiting researcher at Mila, which is in Montreal in Canada, actually, um, which is a collaboration between schools like McGill, uh, University of Montreal, and uh, quite a lot of other institutions as well. Um, he has experience working in deep semi-supervised and unsupervised learning models applied to robotics and computer vision. Uh, so I'm very excited to have Hans here today uh, to talk about this. So we will let him take it away. Off to you, Hans. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. And uh, today I'm going to talk about our work that we published last year in the last uh, Latinx at Neurips workshop. Uh, it was called Learning to Play Soccer by Reinforcement Learning and Applying Sync to Real to Compete in the Real World. Most of this work was developed while, while I was at Mila. Collaboration with my students and research team at Brazil, in Brazil. And let's go, I hope you enjoy it. So um, let, let me talk just a bit about my team in Brazil. Uh, we are at Federal University of Pernambuco in the Center of Informatics. And there is a link for the our website if you want to check it out. It's it, it relates our research and competitions. Uh, we are basically four seven undergraduate and graduate students and four professors, and we work on artificial intelligence, computer vision, and mechanics applied and electronics applied to robotics. And our main activity is participating in robotics competitions such as LARC and RoboCup. And today I'm going to talk about our work uh, for the Latin American Robotics Competition, LARC, which is an event uh, that holds both the uh, uh, LARC and CBR. It's a joint event uh, of those robotics competing, uh, co competition in Latin America. And it's the most prestigious robotics event in Latin America and in Brazil. And we compete in this event since 2016. And its 80th edition occurred in October 2019. And it was the first time that we were able to uh, to take this project and to make it to compete in a real competition with reinforcement learning. And this category has, this com the, uh, this event has multiple categories uh, of competitions in, in robots. And among them, uh, the most uh, popular are the soccer, robot soccer categories. Uh, probably the most popular is the IEEE Very Small Size Soccer League. I'll talk about it today. But there are other interesting categories like the RoboCup Small Size Soccer League, uh, in which the robots are a bit bigger than the small size, of course. And we also competed in the RoboCup at Home League in which robots have to uh, uh, perform commands like take this bag and uh, take this bag to the kitchen table. And last time we, we could compete in this category was, was in 2018. It's a, a bit more complicated than the other ones. And we also have a team that competes in the 2D simulation category. It doesn't involve real robots, but it's also very fun. Okay, so let me talk about the category in which we actually applied reinforcement learning, which is the IEEE Very Small Size Soccer League. Uh, we'll call it just VSSS League, and is probably the most popular and competitive category in LARC. 
it's actually really fun to compete in this category. Is the one that uh, uh, the the uh, the teams probably put most effort to win because it's it's really interesting, and it's basically uh, two teams of three robots, and the robots are actually very small. They are eight, eight centimeter uh, cubes, cubes, cubes of eight centimeter of edge, and so three robots competing against each other each other in a field of 150 centimeters by 130 centimeters and it's basically two halves of five minutes and then we're done uh, there is a camera above the field which is used to track the position of the robots and the ball and a computer that uh, receives the image from the camera processes the scene and sends motion commands to the robots the robots are actually pretty simple. They are basically a receiver and a, a microcontroller, which uh, sends the uh, and controls the real speeds of the, the robots to make them move around and score. And the robots actually are pretty cheap. They are about two hundred dollars to build one robot. A, a full setup of like this for one team can be built by uh, with less than a thousand, probably. So it's it's really interesting because it's uh, an easy way to do robotics and and it's really fun actually. So uh, uh, what what goes into this laptop computer that goes uh, aside the field is basically uh, a software to process the image and send motion comments to the robots. And most teams, uh, actually, all the teams currently use standard. AI techniques like path planning with A star, potential fields, PAD controllers, and handcrafted strategies for the striker, defender, and goalkeeper. And we've been doing this for five years now. And uh, it's actually pretty, it's not that as simple as you might think to plan and make all this happen and to anticipate all the possible situations and plan a specific behavior for each uh, probable situation. For instance, if the ball is in the corner, the robot will not be able to take the ball out of there without spinning. Usually the robots have to spin to take the ball from the corners and it has to spin to the right direction, otherwise it might throw the ball against its own goal. So yeah, you have many behaviors that are uh, need to be uh, the situations need to be identified, then correct behavior should be selected and then applied. So it's it's not very straightforward to do this and in not in a very competitive category like this. So our question is, can we apply reinforcement learning to do everything? Like uh, from the state of the environment uh, to, to uh, predict what action is the most used, su su successful action and perform this action in the environment. So in, this, in a, a typical reinforcement learning setup is like this, we have your environment, you read your state from the environment, so you have it here your agent reading your state from the environment, and the agent performs an action at the environment, and eventually it receives a reward, which might be positive or negative, and the, the uh, job of the agent is to maximize the total reward it accumulates over time. So the, the idea is to, to apply this to the setup. But uh, the problem is that if you do this in real world, you have uh, if, uh, most common uh, traditional uh, reinforcement learning models that we have, we require too many interactions with the environment. So I, I'm, I, I mean like 4 million interactions <laughs> to learn something useful. And if you use real robots to do this, you probably will break a robot before learning anything useful. So this is not very uh, practical. Oh, and so, then the uh, just to quickly clarify, uh, I guess okay. for interactions with the environment, uh, does that mm -hmm. mean there is a, because the action space is too huge or is it um, also like some issue with modeling the state as well? Or both. No, actually, in this problem, as I will frame it afterwards, it's not very difficult to have the states. Uh, we have basically 
a state of real number that represent the positions and velocities of the robots and in, in ball. So the, the, having the state is not the problem in this category at this moment. The problem is that what what action you should take it uh, should select at every single moment and the action space actually continues as well. Uh, you can control the speeds of the robot and this is, this is a continuous action space in a dynamic environment. So the the, the interaction. And one interaction is one loop of this state action cycle here. This is one interaction. So uh, since we can't apply it with the real robots, the basic idea is to learn simulation. So we can apply this uh, the training process of the, our reinforcement learning agent for like millions of interactions with the environment, the simulated environment. And hopefully, after the, our agent learns something, we can transfer this policy it learned to the real world, to the real world robots, and hopefully they will perform similarly. So that's the basic idea. Not not our idea. This is how people in robotics has been doing this currently. So for this to work, our research research questions were. Is it possible to train an, effi an effective VSS agent by reinforcement learning simulation? And we knew before starting that the environment is unpredictable because uh, uh, you, you have the moving opponents and you can't know what the opponents will do at every moment. So it's unpredictable. It's chaotic and dynamic and the situation changes fast and a small difference in may yield very different results. And it's a continuous state and action space. So it's a bit more difficult to, to, to understand the state and to select actions. And the rewards are very sparse. You can uh, have to interact by many, many uh, steps before you actually have an, a, a reward uh, from the environment. And the rewards are basically uh, the most straightforward way of defining rewards in this scenario are the, the goals when you score or you, when you take a goal against your team. A positive reward and the negative reward. This is the most uh, uh, straightforward way to define the rewards in this setup. And well, if we are able to train this agent in simulation, uh, is it possible? to transfer the learning policy to the real robot. And the challenge is the challenge, the basic challenge of this approach is this centurion approach is what we call the reality gap. Uh, what is to say that the, the simulated environment will never be exactly the same as the real world environment. It's not possible to simulate precisely everything. And physical aspects are different and vary like friction, collision, collision coefficients, and um, uh, maybe the, the sizes of the, the, the real agents are not very uh, similar always. And every robot uh, is different. It, and uh, the motors are not the same. The friction is not the same in uh, it real. So it performs changes during the met because of battery uh, level. And real world vision is noisy and unreliable. So which, which is a different scenario from what you have in simulation. So those are the, our research challenges. And I can imagine that the uh, maybe like the movement or like the wheels or something are getting worn down, which could cause some, you know, sure, differences yes. as well. Yes, right. yes, that, 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 that happens very frequently. And it, it's actually a problem even for the traditional approaches to, to work on it, it's, it's difficult. So there, there are other uh, simulated soccer environments for reinforcement learning that I should mention. The problem, the, the, the most famous are the Mohoko soccer, this one from uh, 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 DeepMind, and the Google Research Football, this one. And we, when we started this, res this research, it, the, those simulators were not available yet, but even today that they are available they, they are not actually very useful for our problem because um, in, in most setups, they do not consider the physical aspects. It's not a perfect simulation of the problem. 
they are actually more interested in stu studying collaboration between agents. What's not our focus on this research at this point. Um, and also this uh, Google research football, it's very complex, it's more like a video game with discrete actions. And um, it's a very, very complex scenario for the real world. We could not have robots simulating this scenario. It's very complicated and it's not very easy to simulate those robots in the real world as well. So the simulator that we are considering this research, it was implemented by the, the uh, FATERG University in Brazil. It was implemented using bullet physics engine in C++ and it simulates the VSS environment sufficiently well. So it's a very interesting scenario for Centurial. That's why we choose this path. So our goal, our long-term goal with reinforcement learning in VSS is to win the LARC VSS using reinforcement learning. We hope to do this in maybe in the next competition or in the, the, the one afterwards. And our plan continues to be train simulation and apply simulation techniques. And what we've done so far is we've created an open AI gym environment encapsulating the simulator that already existed. And for those of you who are not familiar with OpenAI Gene, it's like a framework for reinforcement learning, for creating reinforcement learning environments. So we have many reinforcement learning environments implemented using this OpenAI Gene framework. And we encapsulated our simulator inside an OpenAI Gene uh, framework, which we were going to publish soon. And the idea is that the states of the environment are the positions and speeds of all agents, not images. Uh, what is common in reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning nowadays, is to use images. Images, but we are not. We were not interested in stu studying representation learning this problem because we already have software good enough to extract those positions from the camera in the real world. So we can. Uh, actually profit for having those informa this information already extracted and represented so that it's easier for training our models. It, it does, the model doesn't need to learn a representation, just need to learn the policy. And then we see to real. So the architecture that we proposed is composed by uh, two processes, one experience collection process and one training process, they run in parallel. And our experience collection process encapsulates all uh, the multiple agents um, with their exec running policies. And it's basically responsible for interacting, uh, make the interactions between agents and the environment uh, asynchronously from the training processes. And the training process basically has to train the neural networks that are used in the agents. It, it, uh, collects the, the experiences of interaction from the, this, this process. There is a, a queue that accumulates the, those experiences. They go to the experience buffer. And from the experience buffer, the, the experiences are used for training the neural networks that are uh, used for uh, choosing the actions. And this uh, setup allows us to run agents and environment in parallel uh, to have single and multiple agent control from these wrapper, wrapper classes. So we can have one agent controlling the three uh, robots or one agent controlling one, one soccer agent, which is the approach that we are currently using, the single agent approach. And you can also run agents in parallel separately. And also you can do self-play. So all of this is supported in our current environment, which will be available soon, this link here. I guess Susan can put this link at the description of the video after awards. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so what we use here for training, what which reinforcement learning models we consider, we consider three uh, different approaches, the DeepQ mm, network, DQN, which is a neural network is just uh, to learn the quality, the Q, the quality of each discrete action the agent can perform. So this, uh, I have to highlight here that this is a 
uh, a model uh, made for discrete action spaces and you have a continuous action space, so there, there need to be an adaptation. And the policy consists in selecting the action of highest quality. The other method that you consider as, is the asynchronous advantage actor critic, A3C, and which is an, composed by an actor network learning the action policy from the state. It maps states to actions and a critic crit network, uh, which estimates the quality of a single action. So once you have then state in a, the, action the action performance, it will evaluate and have a value for this, the, the, the action that was selected in that state. And in A3C, you have multiple ag independent agents with their own weights, or th their own networks, interacting with different copies of the environment in parallel to speed up learning. And the last one that you consider was Deep Determinist poli Policy Gradient, the DPG, which basically learns a Q function and a, a policy uh, to iterate over actions. And off policy data and the Bellman equations are employed to learn the Q function. And so do you learn the quick Q function and you use the Q function to train your policy? So the, those two are continuous. They can be implied in continuous action spaces and the QN is for discrete action spaces. So first we try H3C because it, it, uh, it, it's compatible with our method. Uh, we we uh, hope that it could learn faster because of the parallelism. And we, we use H3C to control first the left and right wheel speeds directly, and also for the angular and linear speeds, using as reward only goals, plus one for pro and minus one against, but no convergence. So the, our first intuition was that the problem that the rewards were too sparse, there were too many steps being done before a goal would be would happen. So yes, we couldn't have this to work. We also try reward shaping. So reward shaping uh, is a technique to give intermediate rewards for the agent before he, it has a actual, an actual reward from the environment. So what we try is to, was to use positive and nev negative rewards when the robots move towards or away from the ball. So it's, it's basically the gradient of the distance between the agent and the ball. If the agent moves towards the ball, it, has, it gets a positive reward, which is always smaller than the reward it gets from the goal. And if it moves away from uh, the, the ball, it gets uh, a negative reward. And the second one we tried was positive and negative rewards when uh, the ball moves towards or away for the, from the goal. Uh, so if it, if the ball is moving towards the the, the opponent's goal, it gets a positive reward. Otherwise, it gets a negative reward. So if uh, you can with this setup, it, you can basically uh, have rewards at every step. So this this is much uh, more information for the agent. Okay. Oh yes, Hans. I guess I alluded to this before, um, but I guess I was just wondering that is it possible for the agent to maybe learn? Um, let's say they could purposely be further from the ball so that they can catch a sort of pass from a teammate or some sort of strategic behavior. Or I guess is there some sort of con into adding all that kind of detail into reward? Because that might that's pretty complicated planning. Yeah, it, actually it can because the, the, the reward shaping rewards are much, much smaller than you can, the, the, the totals that the, the, the agent can accumulate from those rewards are a lot smaller than what it can accumulate from scoring a goal. So if the agent uh, 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 notices that it's, it's better to wait for the ball in a situation than to go towards the ball because it's going to score uh, if it waits for the ball, more probably it's going to score. Then the, the total reward, the total reward accumulator will be better. Uh, will uh, make the agent to choose to wait for the ball because of the total. So you have to be careful when set up setting up this reward shaping so that you do not disturb the main goal. The, the rewards that the agent accumulates with the main goal should be always higher than what it can accumulate with the reward shaping rewards. 
I see. Yeah. So allowing it to be able to learn to trade off like a short term high reward um, between kind of like the more longer term that what it, yeah. what it wants. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But even implementing this for the H3C, you could not get a convergence, possibly because our implementation was not good enough. I don't know. We, we still are investigating this. I still think that H3C is a good approach for this method. So we're going to try it again in the future. The second one that we tried was DQN. And so DQN requires discrete actions. So the way we've done this is that we have a target. The agent is always moving towards a target position. And the discrete actions are four. And they can basically change. Uh, actually, they are actually five. And they can change the target. So we have a control method that moves the agent towards the target. It's uh, uh, acting all the time. And one action, for instance, C1, it will move the target to this position. C4 will move it to this. C2 will move it to this, and so on. And C0 will keep the target where it is right now. So this is the way we discretize the actions. And of course, this, is, this limits what the agent can do. It cannot. For instance, it spin very fast here because it has to move these this points one step at a time. So it, it does not give some too much uh, freedom to the policy to control the agent as it might want. And we tried this with the straightforward rewards from the environment, and it didn't work. But then when we applied reward shaping, then finally we it was the first time that it could get convergence, and the, the model actually learned something useful. So it was our, uh, the best moment in this research. The first time that we saw the agent actually learning something. It's really, really good. And the next method that we tried was DDPG uh, with continuous state, ac state action spaces. And we finally could achieve what we wanted to have a continuous action space model. Uh, uh, controlling our agent, our agent, and it basically basically it controls the angular and linear speeds of the agent. Uh, so at every step, the agent can set directly the desired angular and linear speeds, and those are converted to wheel speeds to the robot. Uh, if you, uh, we, we also tried the straightforward rewards, but didn't work as well for the DPG. But with reward shaping, our results were pretty good, actually. So uh, here I have some kind of ablation study for the reward function. And here in yellow, it's in the bottom here. I hope, I hope you can see the, the, the mouse cursor. Uh, you can see that it basically learns nothing okay, with only receiving goals as reward. When you add the motion, at uh, reward, which is basically the reward for the agent to move towards the ball, it actually starts to learn something. And it, it's it's actually the, the most important uh, reward shaping technique that we used. The other one is to use just uh, ball position, the, 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 the actually the gradient of the ball the, uh, toward the, the opponent's goal. And if you will use only goals and the motion of the, the ball, it also doesn't work. You have to give something to tell the agent that it has to interact with the ball. After the agent learns to interact with the ball, then it can learn to score. So this, this reward is really important for our agents to start learning. But if we compose both strategies, then you have this green curve here. And the agent learns actually much, much faster because it learns to go to, towards the ball and also to approach the ball correctly to take it to the opponent's goal. Right. Mm. Uh, as a quick recap for, I guess, someone who joined maybe later, um, the ball okay. position is captured by the cam real life cameras that are um, set above kind of the, uh, the kind of play. The field. Yes, yeah, the yes, field. The field. Yeah. <laughs> the field, gotcha. Exactly, exactly. Yes, it, 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 the agent knows the position of the ball at the time, so it's easier. It's easy for it to compute the, the this, this gradients, the gradient of the, the 
the agent towards the ball and the gradient of the ball towards the goal. So yeah. Is the velocity transmitted from the kind of robot itself to um, maybe like the control, the laptop, or is it uh, just like how is the velocity known? It's, to com it's com uh, there is a, a one step before going to our agent, which is to compute the state. And we have vision algorithms to detect the positions and then an integrator to compute speeds. And then we, we, we compose the state uh, from this, the positions and speeds of all elements in the scene. And this is the state that our agents receive. Gotcha. OK, so um, uh, here you can see the evolution of the DPG goal scores compared with the, the uh, I forgot to mention another another detail. And uh, here, this case goal, I don't know if you, people can see, but from 0 to 8, it's goal scores here. So goal scores in five minutes, right? And uh, when we apply this same function, the, here is the DQN, when we apply it to DDPG, it worked, but not as fast as, as in the Q, DQN, uh, the first try that we, we, the first way, because we noticed that our agents would spin very, very quickly and it would move towards the ball spinning, which is something that's very strange actually. The, the, the agent moves spinning while spinning towards the ball. Basically, they're, they're, the agent learned that because once it touches the ball, it throws the ball to the direction it wants. So yeah, it, it wasn't very a very interesting approach because it would not probably translate well to the real world. world because, they, because of the inertia of the real robots in the real world is much more difficult. And yeah, it would basically, uh, spend too much battery, um, so that would would be a very good policy to move spinning. So then we added an uh, uh, energy component to only for the DPG because with DQN it couldn't spin very fast, but with the DPG since it's a continuous action space it can spin. But when we added this energy penalty, then the agent learns faster. And the final policy actually is much more pleasant to look. <laughs> and here it's, it is comparing the DDPG with DQN. We see that in five minutes, the DDPG can score around 10 goals and DQN around seven goals. OK. Uh, so, question uh, from the audience, actually. Uh, OK. What would you want to drop the amount of reward shaping after the agent learns to interact with the ball? Yes, we tried it. We tried it in two ways. We tried uh, decreasing the the uh, the reward shaping with time. Uh, it didn't actually work very well. Actually, it seems that those rewards are still needed for those methods, even after learning. And we also tried before to pre-train and model, and then, then take this pre-trained model and just put it in an environment without reward shaping. But the performance usually degrades with time as well. So it didn't work. Awesome, okay. thanks. Yeah, so uh, in well, now we have good agents performing well in simulation. How do we translate this to the real world? And the setup that we come up with was basically called in the literature like domain adaptation. Basically, we have to adapt the, the actions selected from the network to the real agents in the real world. And what we've done was to train a neural network to learn how to achieve the angular and linear speed desired by the policy. So that the policy has as an output desired uh, desired angular and linear speeds. Our network take this as input as the current linear and angular speeds. And it has to take this information map to wheel speeds, to the wheel of the left, to, to the speed of the left, left and right wheels. And then this results in a new angular and, and linear speeds which are observed in the next step.
and then this circle circulates here. So basically to do this, we have to let the agent interact with the environment for a, uh, a little. You can use random actions, for instance, selecting random random uh, desired speeds inside the, the possible interval and let the network, uh, and then we create basically a data set of desired speeds, current speeds and uh, wheel speeds. And after creating this data set, like for making the robot to, to perform randomly in the environment for like five or 10 minutes, we collect this data set and then we train this network. And yeah, it, the, the problem is that it has to be done for each agent because the agents are different. And it has basically to be calibrated before every uh, competition because uh, it degenerates. The, the robots change over time, right? And not, not only the battery, but also the, the degrade, the performance of the robots degrade of time. So it has to be trained. So it's not very practical for competition, but it, it works actually. And another challenge is that the, the state data is noisy because we have real camera. It's not a simulated information coming from simulator. It's a real camera, so there is noisy. The, the, the positions move around a little bit. So we have a few filters to, to filter this information before giving to the network. And also there is the delay in the real world actually is not equal to the delays observed in, in the simulation. Actually, they can change because the delay depends on the camera setup. So the, the camera setup may have to be changed during the competition because of the illumination. And this changes the delay between vision and common. So yeah, so actually, even with this, uh, we could achieve very good results in transfer learning. And here is a, a video with the DPG trained in three stages. First, we train it against uh, agents moving randomly. So the all, all, all the other opponents and uh, teammates were moving randomly. Only one agent was being controlled by our network. Then we turn on the uh, the AI of the simulator. The simulator has a basic AI implemented, not very smart one, but we play against this AI. And then after that, we play, we do self play. We play one, the, the same policy running and competing against itself in a one against one setup with the other agents moving randomly. And this is the result that we get. Let me show this is was so basically DQN now. Uh, learning from scratch with the other agents stopped. So it's after four, 40 million steps, about two days in one GPU, it can score pretty well, actually. Now this is the DPG. It also can move, can move faster than DQM. Now, an example of self-play. Uh, it's it's actually pretty cool to watch those videos. I I I, I always got mes mesmerized by <laughs> learn, looking at those robots. Just a uh, uh, small detail that I want to stress here that they, they they learn very interesting skills. Like for instance, to spin in the corners, like here, to move the ball, or to spin to kick the ball. I don't know if you can see that, but if you can, it spins to kick the ball towards the goal. Wow. And, oh, that's very cool. That's yeah. But th there is another behavior that I'll, I'd like to to show here. We uh, we we spent like five years programming those robots, and we would never program so, something like this. Not notice that the agent uses the side to move the ball. Look at this. You mm, see that it, right. it's, it's, some, it's a behavior very difficult to, to program. No, no one would ever think of programming this kind of behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Actually, someone asked what was the so the, in the previous part of the video, the environment, the simulation. What uh, mm -hmm. was it again? The simulation. The simulation. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's called VSS SDK, SDK. And actually we took those, the simulation implemented by FATERG team at Rio, and we modified it a, a bit to be uh, more uh, adequate for reinforcement learning. And we will release both environment and the simulator that we use in a, in a few days. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so I'll link the, uh, the GitHub link uh, okay, to the good. chat. Then. Awesome. Thank, thank you. And it also use, learns to use the walls. It moves the ball towards the wall because it's easier. <laughs> and it's very difficult to, to do this in, in programming, actually. And this is one test that we've made. The, the, the yellow one, the yellow one is the one we programmed by hand. And the blue one is the one training with DDPG. So let's watch it. You see the robot like wob uh, wobbling a bit around, not going very straight. This is a problem in our century approach. It doesn't do this in simulation, so it can it can prove a bit. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, here you can see DDPG uh, playing against a real competitor in the last competition that we played. It was also trained the same way. But now in this setup, we have three agents competing because the competition is three against three. But it was training in a single agent setup. So the problem is that if you train in a single agent setup, they don't learn to collaborate very well. But actually, as this, at the same time, we were not able to train them in a multi-agent setup. So what we could do for the last competition was to take the, sing the single agent policy and to replicate the same policy for the three agents. It's not very cooperative, but it worked actually pretty well, much better than we thought, actually. So let's see the video for a while. Yeah, and show on. It's a bit. Okay, this one is the DPG, and this is the opponent. Yeah, uh, I guess you can, maybe the audience can, can take a look at those videos afterwards. I will share the link with you guys. It's like an eight, eight minutes video. <laughs> I <can laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Actually, I have a quick question. Uh, so there was that slight moment where the ball was kind of in the middle of two bots and then the two um, robots were kind of not very quickly moving toward it. Does that, is that kind of just happening in the beginning or? <laughs> What what happened? What happened oh, in yeah. situation? The, the problem with machine learning approaches is that it's very difficult to say why they choose As, yeah, certain, yeah. certain thing. And, yeah, yeah, and I, we, we got we got many questions like this in, during the competition, and and we could we just couldn't answer why they, they chose to do the, to do it. Yeah, it, makes sense. It's, it's, it's actually very difficult to predict the behavior they they do. But one thing that is interesting is that they. They display many kind of unexpected behavior that act actually at the end are are good behaviors that you can see you can't see from the beginning, but after observing for a time, you understand why it does it. So th th at this point, that's the very moment I couldn't. 
actually it was interesting because many teams couldn't believe that we are using <laughs> reinforcement learning. <laughs> they were pretty amazed by the results actually. So talking about the results, uh, this in the last LARC in 2019, we got fourth place out of 24 teams. And these are the scores against uh, the other teams. So 10-0, 10-0, 11-1, 11-1. 10-0, 11-1, 8-0, and then we got to the same finals, and then we lost to the, the, the same team that they showed you the in the video. But in the next match, we won from the champion of the 2000, 2018. So it was actually, uh, uh, we, we, we didn't believe we could win from the champion of the last year champion. And, yeah, at the end we lost to it in the second match because one thing they can do is they can adapt their policies. It's easier for the other teams to adapt and change. And we didn't train our network again. We, we basically could train simulation. We couldn't do much to improve it at, during the competition. The other teams came and then they, they won the second match against us, but for a tight margin. And yeah, we, we were actually very, very happy with the results obtained in the competition. And that's it. And uh, for conclusion, uh, we, we observed that promising behavior, promising behavior of DQN and DDPG, the century approach worked well, better than we expected, actually. But the multi-agent uh, approach didn't work we couldn't train uh, multiple agents to collaborate. So this is a future work to make them collaborate. And we could also initialize our experience buffer with real world data to see if it improves into real. And we can try state-of-the-art continuous control techniques such as PPO or JRPO. We are all using only off-policy off methods at this point. And after that, we want to extend to the small size soccer league. So that's it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, we have quite some online questions, if you don't mind <laughs> asking Me those. Too. I guess for the first one, can you flip to the previous slide uh, for sure. a second as well? Um, I guess for the uh, off policy, uh, Okay, okay, so just like backtracking a little bit um, mm -hmm. for um, DDPG, right? Uh, you mentioned one versus one um, mm -hmm. self play, right? So it was playing against um, the current policy, or was it also playing against previous policies, like off policy uh, training? Yeah, it, it was, it was uh, competing against the, the, the current policy, but with noisy. Mm -hmm. with noise added. So, yeah, we, because it's very difficult to evaluate the model if it's competing against itself with the same capability. So we basically vary the noise levels of the opponent. So we have something like a variation over time. So the, the noise levels vary over time. And then uh, hopefully the agent will learn to compete against very good agents or in against not so good agents. I see. And someone did ask if you were going to try PPO, and then you did mention here and that you would. So I guess, um, what are thoughts on, you know, potential challenges or what might smoothly be transli uh, transitioning into trying like PPO or TRPO? Well, uh, the results that they have in the literature for the continuous state space actions are really good. So we, we hopefully will see an improvement in this, this result. We started actually from uh, off policy with experience buffer methods because in the beginning we we at the beginning we were not so sure that we could learn from scratch, so we were planning to initialize this buffer with information from real world competitions. Actually, we ended up not doing this because it wasn't necessary. And this is why we started with off policy methods with experience replay buffer. But the next step is surely to try PPO and TRPO because they are probably better than those approaches. Since now we can learn, uh, we know that we can learn from scratch. Those are the prob probable most 
uh, interesting candidates to try. Gotcha. Um, another question, I think uh, it, it was if you use population based training when you train several agents and save their clones to train against. But I think this is similar to my previous question of uh, if you have yes. trained against policies. Actually, we, we didn't. The, those agents actually take a long time to train already for a single agent. And due to limitations in computational resources, and also implementation has to improve a bit to, to do this. So. We didn't try it yet. Gotcha. Uh, I'm just going to ask if there is any more final questions. <laughs> One second. Yeah, people are really excited about this. They're chatting about um, someone made their own uh, environment in Unity. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people excited about this. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely when the, uh, I guess, VSS environment goes live, uh, you can link us again, or you can send it to me again, and then I'll be sure to share it with the audience. Yeah, actually, we, we were planning to, to create our own environment because the, 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 the simulator was not developed for reinforcement learning. It was developed for teams to test their, their own handcrafted policies. So it's it's not actually the best that we can achieve for this purpose. It, so implementing it in, in something like PyBullet so that we can run GPU and things similar would probably improve our performance, I think. I see. OK, one, one more question. Um, it says, in an adversarial setting, did the two agents, wait, so I, I guess I'm I'm trying to understand the question. Like, if sev if there's different agents, do they have use the same neural net with the shared weights? Because you mentioned before um, about using neural nets for representation. Um, yes, yes, sure. Yes, when in the the adversarial setup, they were using uh, the same network, but uh, just a small difference because we uh, we always have a target network and an online network. And one uses the the online network, and the other uses the target network. That's basically the, the the only difference. So that yeah, we can have collect samples from the the current policy and the the best best policy that we have, which is the 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 target network policy. Awesome. I'm just going to ask if. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, lots of uh, engagement people very excited about this topic. Uh, oh. I guess we will wrap it up um, since uh, we have answered a lot of those questions and you did get quite a lot. <laughs> so I'm very excited for this and we'll definitely share your uh, uh, the links or anything. Just feel free to send it to me. And for the audience, um, anyone, uh, we will be posting these on our website, which you can find. All right. Yeah. Thanks again, Hans. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks everybody for for joining us today. All right.